Hello, welcome back. It's Michael again and we are continuing, continuing talking exactly about the same thing as we did in the last episode, but we are doing, going to do something a bit different today. I am not going to write code today, rather I will discuss one of the most fundamental concepts of object orientation and that is dynamic method dispatch and method overriding and inheritance. We have seen in the last episode um, how to write the code to use uh, inheritance and method overriding. Um, but this uh, principle of, of method overriding and method dispatch is so important and so fundamental to understand that I just want to take a few minutes to explain to you really the background how this all works. Because there are a lot of Java programmers out there who cobble the code together somehow by trial and error and don't really understand the exact details how this works. So let's have a look before we go on to write more code um, and have a quick discussion about what really went on when we wrote the code that we did in the last episode. So let's see whether we can work out what happens when our simulation actually runs. The situation we had is we had a class person in our simulation and we also had a class child, that is the new class that we introduced in the last episode. And then we made child a subclass of person. And we have also seen that the person class uh, includes a number of methods, act, move, in fact others and so on. I don't list them all here, but you get the idea. There are some method definition in this class. What we then also did is we redefined um, some of the methods in the child class. The move and change image method, we added um, the, the situation that's called overriding, that is we have a redefinition of the methods that was inherited in the child class. So that is our situation that we created in our code. Then at runtime, what happens is that we have a whole number of objects. We have a whole number of person objects. We had um, a couple of hundred of them. And we also have a whole number of child objects. So the Greenfoot runtime, when the uh, simulation runs, has a collection of person and child objects all mixed together in the world. Now one thing to, uh, that is important to understand in Java is that every object has a reference to its class. So every person object has a reference to its class which is called in Java the instance of reference. So the person actually knows its own class and it holds a reference to its class. And the same is true of course for the child objects. Every child object will have an instance of reference to its own class. So that is the situation once the objects, the actor objects in Greenfoot have been created. And now when the simulation is runs, the Greenfoot framework invokes the, act, invokes the act method on every object. So the Greenfoot framework itself has a variable. Um, that variable is of type actor and we call it actor here. And then the Greenfoot framework has a loop where it goes around and assigns every actor object that lives in the world in turn to this variable and then invokes the act method on it. And it will do that one by one for every object in the simulation uh, in turn. So let's see whether we can understand in detail what works, what happens when this is going on. So the Greenfoot framework um, has one of the objects in its actor variable and even though the type, note that here is actor, it is legal to have a person stored in it or to have a child stored in it because person and child both are subclasses of actor and you know by subclassing rules a variable can hold objects of its declared type or any subtype of the declared type. So the Greenfoot framework can have all the actor objects in its actor variable because the actor objects in Greenfoot are always subclasses of actor. So we call the act method on the current object. What happens then is that the Java runtime framework follows the instance of pointer and finds the class of the current object and in this class searches for a method that matches the method that we want to call here. So it finds the act method in the person class and it executes this act method on the current object. So this current object then acts. And the act method itself of course can call uh, some of its own internal method. It, in fact, in our case, it calls move and it calls infect others and so on. Um, that's all fine. So that is fairly straightforward. 
But now look, let's look at what that looks like when inheritance is involved. So when we move on to the next object, because this person has now acted, the next person might act, but at some point the next actor will be a child object. So the act as a child, we invoke act on the child object. And now let's observe what happens. We invoke act on this child object. As always, we follow, well, if I say we, the Java runtime system follows the instance of reference, finds the class of this object and looks here for an act method. It does not find an act method here, but that's okay because we have a super class. So what the Java runtime system does is if the invoked method is not defined in the current class, it follows the super class um, reference and looks for the method in the super class. So it finds the act method here and executes it. That is why the child can act even though it doesn't have an act method in its own class. That is what we mean with that the child class inherits the act method. It is essentially can be called on child objects as if the child class had an act method because the act method is available for children as well. Now had the child class had its own act method this act method here would have been executed instead. In our simulation uh, in the previous episode we saw that briefly. Initially I had an empty act method in the child class and when we ran the simulation the effect that we saw was that children did not move and that is because the act invocation then invoked this act method down here and this act method was empty so the children did not do anything. Um, by just removing this act method we have now uh, made the child class inherit this act method and the child initially behaved exactly the same as the person. Th those are the basics of dynamic dispatch in Java, method invocation, how method invocation with inheritance works. Um, but there's one detail that is really important to understand that even many seasoned Java programmers don't understand and that is the fact that local method dispatch is also dynamically dispatched. I will explain what I mean with that. Um, the, what I mean is this, when we called the act method on the child object, there was no act method here, we went up there, we are executing this act method here. Now the implementation of the act method in our case in itself contained method calls. One of the first things that the act method did is it called the move method. Now it is tempting to think that this act method will always invoke this move method because it's in the same class and we did not write an object qualifier in front of the method call. So we did not write some object dot move, we just wrote move. Now it's important to understand that every method call, even internal method calls that are to a method that is not private is always dynamically dispatched, which means we always go via the current object reference. So when we call here, when we have here in the act method the move call, what that actually means is that the move method is, is invoked on the current object. It is essentially a this.move me uh, method call that we have here. So when this act method calls the move method, it actually goes to the current object, it goes back here and follows the instance of reference again and looks for the move method. And so when the current object is a child object, um, this move method here gets executed even though the call comes from this act method up here. So um, that is why even though we have not redefined act, we have only redefined move, um, when the current object is a child object, this move method is executed and not this move method. And that is how we get different behavior for our child object's movement and only for the movement um, than from the person classes uh, objects. And, and whereas the other behavior like infection and healing, because we have not redefined it, then works exactly the same as in the superclass. And the same principle is again used with the change image where the change image is actually invoked from the set status method. So the first call externally came to set status which was not in child we find it here but set status then calls change image and again it goes via the current object and finds the overridden 
change image method here. That is a lot to take in. This is one of the really fundamental principles of object-oriented programming. It doesn't matter whether you program in Java or in any other object-oriented language, the principles of dynamic method dispatch with inheritance are at the core of object orientation. So think about this a bit, play around with it until you understand it. Okay, that is it for today. That was the principle of method overriding and method dispatch in Java and in fact in just about every dynamically typed, statically typed, sorry, statically typed dynamic dispatched object oriented language. Um, next episode we will write some code again. See you next time.